Hobbs Oxford has previously briefly introduced a few of the most beautiful colleges of Oxford University. In this series, Rob Walters, your experienced Oxford guide, presents you with a more detailed look at a selection of these. Here, we spotlight the College of Maudlin. Beauty may be in the eye of the beholder, but one of the beauties of being a city guide in Oxford is that you get to experience the beauty of the colleges through fresh eyes. Sometimes I contrive to get ahead of my group as we enter a college quad, then turn and observe the wonder and delight in their eyes. Here we spotlight a college that has often delighted my visitors. It is Maudlin. The college began on St Swithin's Day in 1458, when William of Wainfleet persuaded his king to dedicate the land of the defunct St John the Baptist monastic 13th century hospital to his grand idea. Significant parts of that older building can be seen in the old kitchen bar, shown here, and in the high street frontage, topped with its wonderful line of grotesques. You can't miss the bell tower, which is one of Oxford's outstanding landmarks, but that was added later. Let's locate the college on John Speed's map of 1605, noting that in his day, North was at the bottom. As you can see, it is just outside the old city walls. It is in fact the first college that a visitor entering the city from the east will see. Assuming that they were walking across Maudlin Bridge, they could look down on the two branches of the Charwell River, which unite just there, having embraced the land area wryly called Mesopotamia. Here's a map showing the vast grounds of the college, which are outlined in black. The bell tower is shown by an arrow. You can see here how far Maudlin extends to the north. That's its sports ground. And here's the view from above. Such a green and pleasant location alongside the tree-lined Charwell River. Here's the entrance to the college from the High Street. Let's go through the Porter's Lodge into the aptly named St John's Quad. On the left is the President's Lodging, with a handsome tree of India standing at the foot of it. Not a bad place to live while you're heading up this grand college. Just to the right of it is the Founders Tower. Stepping back again, these three sets of Gothic windows terminate the west end of the chapel. Beyond that, you might just glimpse a rare outdoor pulpit. Every year a sermon is delivered from there, celebrating St John's Day, and that's followed by tea and cake in the lodging. Mm. Behind us are the mainly 19th century St Swithin's and Long War quads, pleasant additions to the college uh, with the present library visible at the top left. But now we we'll return to the older part of this splendid college, passing through the door beneath the Muniment Tower where the college records are stored and then turning right into the chapel. Most colleges have an anti-chapel and this is Maudlin's. It's large and richly decorated, possessing some fine examples of stained glass in the west window. Here we are looking at the entrance to the main body of the chapel, which in a normal church would be the choir. Note the carvings of musicians above it. Inside the chapel itself is equally splendid, though changed somewhat from the original 15th century rendition. For example, the finely carved reredos behind the altar dates from the 19th century. Leaving the chapel, we turn right towards what to my mind is the most memorable architectural feature of Maudlin, the famous cloister or great quadrangle. This image is often the first glimpse visitors gain as they walk around the covered perimeter looking in at the closely trimmed lawn through the unglazed stone tracery. The lawn is edged by white hydrangea bushes topped by an ancient clematis creeper and strewn with strange stone carvings known as hieroglyphs. 
This is the view towards the south. It is indeed beautiful. The first floor windows to the left of the great tower belong to the dining hall. Let's take a peek inside there. As ever, the top table is somewhat raised and lies crossways at the end of the hall. Everyone dines here under the unblinking glare of the busts of two contentious ex-students, Oscar Wilde and Lord Denning. From the tower itself, we can look north over the cloister towards a very different piece of architecture. This is still called the New Building, despite its origin in the 18th century. Palladian in style, there were plans to replace the old cloister with buildings like this. Fortunately, this did not happen. Phew! The new building has accommodation for students and rooms for fellows. C.S. Lewis was here for many, many years. From the rear, he would have looked out onto the grove where the college deer herd quietly grazes. How Narnia! Here it is seen from the southeast. The pathway in front of the ornate gates is the evocative Addison's Walk, which encircles the water meadow and leads up into the fellow's garden. Gosh, if all this seems impossibly beautiful at times, then that's because it is. Expansion goes on. Here we see the Grove buildings, which have an entrance on Longwall Street. This, the college's western perimeter, which does indeed have a long wall and a tall wall. These buildings are relatively new, having been constructed in the 1990s, thus proving that architecturally sympathetic additions are still possible at a price. Our final look at this admirable college takes place from the south. Look closely and you will see that the high street here is jam-packed with people. What are they doing there at six in the morning? Well, it's May Day, and thousands come from far and wide to hear Maudlin's famous choir sing in the summer from the top of the bell tower. And then the pubs of Oxford open at seven. Great day. And finally, we have a view of that imposing bell tower again from the Botanic Gardens. Why? Because those gardens, though operated by the University, actually belong to the beautiful College of Magdalen. Hence, quite rightly, the President of Magdalen gets first pick of the bananas from those greenhouses. Quite right. <laughs> wow. How lucky people like Oscar Wilde, Schrodinger, C.S. Lewis, Andrew Lloyd Webber were to spend years of their lives in such a beautiful environment. Hope you enjoyed it. Do subscribe. There will be more in this series coming along. And don't forget to request notification. Bye bye.